TV. I am inviting you today to hop on the glory train. That's right, we're gonna ride the glory train today from 1 Corinthians 11 verses three and seven through 10. This is Martin Zender from the edge of the bottom of the Floridan Peninsula. This is my last uh, show on the book Eve Race. This book is available for sale now. Go to martinzender.com. You get all kinds of details about how you can get this book. I was at a party last night. I have to tell you, I was at a birthday party of uh, Juliana and my um, mutual friend, Gabriella. She's a girl from Poland. She was staying at this house when I first moved here three years ago. I gave her a copy of this book for her birthday. Who wouldn't want this? Divine Principles of Sexual Attraction. I signed it for her and she was very pleased. I also gave her a bottle of champagne. I mean, this book and champagne? Huh. <laughs> yes. Thought I'd, you know, lubricate the truth a little bit with a little bubbly. So she loved it. But here's what happened. It was amazing. Um, some people started asking me what I did for a living. Oh, by the way, I'm in front of the door cam here. Welcome to the door cam. This is the door of the cottage. The Canadians, they they didn't leave, but they went on a cruise. So they're in, on a four-day cruise. So I'm going to take advantage of it and film on their porch in front of their door. I think this is the first show with the door cam. So last night I was at this party. People asked me what I do for a living. I tell them I'm a writer. And of course they say, well, what do you write? And I say, well, I write on spiritual topics and sexual topics. I say, in fact, I gave the birthday girl a gift today. One of my latest books is out. It's called Divine Principles of Sexual Attraction. People go, Ooh, what? And I went and got the book, showed it to them. There were seven people, more, just gathering around this thing. They saw the cover. They, they were delighted, they were intrigued. Then they read this on the back and a couple girls there were saying, oh my God, this sounds, this makes so much sense. And people were asking me more details about it. So for a while I was holding court. I, I hijacked the birthday party to talk about divine principles of sexual attraction. And I said, well, you know, I, I said, I'm just a guy who looks for the deep answers to deep questions like I'm a kind of guy that wonders why there are even two sexes to begin with and they go yeah why are there two sexes I said well you asked the right guy about that it's a parable you know how the Sun going up and down is a parable of good and evil and the seasons life and death these cycles of life and death I said the power of sexual attraction is also a parable of something great and I took names I took addresses People wanted this book, and they said, "They said I know five friends of mine right now who would love this book." You know, the great thing about this, folks, is in the back of this book, I have excerpts from my other books. Got a little excerpt in here from a book called uh, "How to Be Free from Sin While Smoking a Cigarette," "First Idiot in Heaven," "Beyond Politics," "How to Quit Church Without Going to God." So, by getting this book with this cool, sexy cover, people find about the other information so i wanted to report that to you i wish if i had brought a dozen books with me i could have dispensed with them all but i didn't think of it i forget how great this stuff is how how can i possibly forget so eve race i we're gonna jump on the glory train you're gonna jump on it with me and i'm gonna read another misunderstood passage that makes women think that the apostle paul does not like them. But the Apostle Paul likes them a lot. The Apostle Paul loves them. This woman on the cover is being shut up by a man, but after they read this book, the men free the woman. Look at that. The woman in the form of a butterfly is being set off into the atmosphere to fly free and to feel valuable again as a woman. I want you as a woman to feel valuable again because I think there is a lot of leftover angst and disappointment and and a lot of resentment that has come from the way organized religion um, has treated women in the past. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 
verse 3 and verses 7 through 10. Now I want you to be aware, Paul says, that the head of every man is Christ, yet the head of the woman is the man, yet the head of the man is, yet the head of Christ is God. For a man indeed ought to be covering his head, being inherently in the image and glory of God, yet the woman is the glory of the man. For man is not out of woman, but woman out of man. For also man is not created because of the woman, but woman because of the man. I know, this is Paul. I wouldn't have written it this way. I would have written it in a more succinct, more understandable way. But this is what we're dealing with, so we have to deal with it. Therefore, the woman ought to have authority over her head because of the messengers, that is, the angels. Thanks, Paul, for the simple little piece of, of writing there. But I make sense of this, because I make sense for... Uh, a, a living I mean I'm not saying this doesn't make sense but there's a translation issue here right Paul didn't write in English he wrote in Greek so we have to cut him a little bit of slack English was not his native language okay so we have some translation issues but maybe not translation issues specifically here because the translation I just read you is sound but issues of idiom right the way they think back in that day, the way they speak, words they use, not necessarily what we use. But here's how we commonly picture the headship. I'm going to show you a little, a, little, a little graphic that I have in this book on page 46. Because this is where the glory train is. Right? I'm going to read it again. The head of every man is Christ, yet the head of the woman is the man, yet the head of Christ is God. So we have... A headship thing starting with God God Christ man and woman now we instinctively look at this it is headship but as I said the fact that a woman that a man is put as the head of a woman in a covenant relationship that is a marriage under God makes no commentary on the man's superiority it's just as Clyde Pilkington used to put it, this was so good, he says, a yield sign at an intersection does not, is not making any kind of statement as to which driver is superior. It's not, the, the driver who has to yield is not inferior to the driver who does not have to yield. It's just, we have to do something here, we have to make one lane yield so that cars don't crash. We're not saying that the people in the yield lane are worse or stupider or anything. So headship has nothing to do with the intelligence or the superiority of any one over the other. It could, but here it doesn't. When it comes to men and women, it doesn't. So here's how we commonly picture the headship order of 1 Corinthians 11. Watch the door cam carefully. Look at this, right? This is how we see it. God, I put God in dark face type with a larger font. God is great. Christ is great, but God is greater. Man, ah, he's in a smaller font. And woman, eh, she's way down here at the end. This is how we usually think of this. I contend to you today in front of this door that that apprehension is incorrect. And we ought not to look at it this way because this is not an order of greatness but an order of glory uh -huh. putting a different spin on it already aren't i we assume that the order of headship here is an order of greatness from the greatest to the least beginning with god if that's the case then woman is the least god's the greatest woman is the least she's not worth anything she's on the tail end of the God train. And this is the God train. No, this isn't the God train, it's the glory train. Because I'm just reading the context. I can read. It doesn't say this is an order of greatness, it's an order of glory. So, notice this. A man indeed ought not to be covering his head, being inherently in the image of glory of God, yet the woman is the glory of the man. All right, now, I'm going to use the analogy of the sun. Nobody's ever seen the sun with the naked eye. All you see, you, what you see is, uh, you see the corona. You see the glory of the sun. So the corona is out of the sun just as woman is out of man. She is his glory. This is easier to see with God and Christ. God no one has ever seen. God's 
invisible. And Christ, we know, is the image of God. So Christ becomes his glory. Since we don't see God, use the analogy of the sun, we've never seen the surface of the sun. We only see the outshining of the sun, the corona, the glory of the sun. No one has ever seen God, but we see Christ. Christ is the outshining of God. He is, if you will, the corona of God. He's what we see. Now, Christ comes out of God just as man comes out of Christ. And woman comes out of man and light comes out of the sun. See, we're seeing things coming out. Christ comes out of God. Man comes out of Christ. Woman literally comes out of Adam. And the analogy in the natural world I'm, I'm giving you is the glory or the shining, the light comes out of the sun. So, I don't want to get into specifics on the headship issue about why a woman should not cover or why a woman should cover but a man not cover his head. This seems like why does Paul bring this up? There's a huge truth here and I am hesitating because I don't really want to get into it because it's going to take a lot of time. I want to get into the woman's glory, that is her tresses and this is a it's a big thing to me and it's a mystery to many people but of course I have solved the mystery using a correctly translated strict, uh, scripture I will just say this is that if a man were to cover his head Paul says a man ought not to do that because because Christ is his head. So it's like if a man is to pray with his head covered, this was a tradition back then, but it pictures a spiritual truth. Let's say a man has his head covered. Paul says, no, you shouldn't do that. Why? He's saying that in this verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You shouldn't do that because Christ is your head. So by you putting something on your head, you are kind of insulting insulting Christ symbolically it's all symbolic it's all symbolic it's like you will have nothing between you and Christ okay you have nothing between you and Christ that is the the proximity the nearness the closeness of man and Christ yet the woman is said to have authority over her own head so the woman is to cover well, wait a minute. Why should the woman cover? Because the man is her head. Not that Christ isn't her head also, but in this presentation, Paul says the man is the head of the woman. So the woman doesn't have the same relationship with the man as the man has with Christ. With Christ, it's don't cover your head because you have a direct access. And I'm good. Me and you, Christ and man, we're, you don't need to cover. But the woman requires protection. Her covering is a level of protection saying that even though the man is her head, he's not as much of her head as Christ is the head of the man. You see what I mean? There's a disconnect here between the woman and the man that does not exist between the man and Christ. This is why the man does not cover, but the woman covers it says right here, I've never heard this emphasized, this part, therefore the woman ought to have authority over her head. The woman has an authority over her head. So she's a bit autocratic here, whereas the man is not. So her, her covering is a suggestion that she actually needs a bit of protection from this man. And we're not going to say that she is is subject to him in the same way that the man is subject to Christ. Now, both the woman and the man are subject to Christ. But if we're going to look at it in a smaller scale and just look at the relationship between the woman and the man or the wife and the husband, then we would have to say, uh, yeah, lady, you need an extra layer. You need protection because we have to make the statement that you are not to be subject to this man as the man is to Christ. You don't have that kind of, because Christ is 
is benevolent. The man, not always benevolent, not always, but Christ guaranteed, he's gonna be good, so take that freaking hat off. Take that freaking hat off. God's good, God's great, you don't have to worry about him, you're good. But the woman, ha <laughs> ha, no, no. We're not so confident about her husband, not so confident. Just, there's a little bit of a doubt that he's gonna be as wonderful toward her as Christ is toward him. So she is to cover, that's why. She has authority that the man doesn't, she has authority under the man that the man doesn't have under Christ. She's a bit autonomous. Not that she's not under his headship, she is. It says it right here, that man is the head of the woman. But we're not gonna go crazy with this. So woman, cover your head, it's all symbolic. It's all symbolic. And it's for the sake of the messengers. The messengers see this, that is, the angels, the word for angels, angelos in the Greek, it, the literal element of the meaning is messenger. In other words, the angels are the lowest form of spiritual life. They're the messenger boys. They just get coffee, go to Dunkin' Donuts, bring back a dozen cream sticks, that kind of thing. That's what they do. They bring messages to earth, to earth, they're dispatched. We've never seen the big boys. We've never seen the, the uh, world mice, the authorities. The sovereignties. Oh, who? No, no. We just see the angels. I want to see an angel, Martin. Uh, why? They're not that great. So the angels are learning something, though. They're the closest ones to Earth. They're the ones nearest to what's going on here. By a woman having this sub sovereignty over her own head. All right. Now the shocker. The shocker. Let me turn to it. It is on page, yes, 54 of my book. All right. If Christ is the glory of God, and man is the glory of of God and Christ. And woman is the glory of God, Christ, and man, then what is the glory of a woman? The answer, her hair. The glory of a woman is her hair. I know, what the heck, why? hair. I've never heard what I'm about to tell you, okay? I studied this for years and I believe it was the Holy Spirit of God that illuminated me on this. Woman is such a complete being within herself. She is the last thing that left the finger of God. Think about it. God has not created one thing since he created Eve. Nope. So she is the pinnacle of God's creative prowess. She is Adam 2.0. She is so great and so complete that Another being is not created after her to be her glory. Because you notice how this glory train works. God. And then coming out of God is Christ. Christ is the glory of God. Coming out of Christ is a man. Man's the glory of Christ. Coming out of the man is the woman. Woman is the glory of the man. And coming out of the woman is what? Another being? Another creature? No. Her hair comes out of her. Look, I didn't invent this. I didn't write this. I'm trying to explain it to you because it is wonderful that God would do this. I'm quoting from my book now. Since woman is the end of the glory road, I'm going to show you a different chart now and show you how amazing this is. And since she is the most sophisticated creation of God, only something on her person could be her glory and it's her hair. And I quote now from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. Paul, 
speaking. Is not even nature itself teaching you that if a man indeed should have tresses, it is a dishonor to him? Yet if a woman should have tresses, it is her glory. If a woman should have tresses, it is her glory. Tresses are the glory of a woman. So here's the glory train. First, I'm going to show you that first chart again on the door cam here. Here it is. This is how we have always pictured the glory train beginning with God. I'm having lighting issues now. God, Christ, man, woman. And God is in large font, dark type. Woman is in a tiny font with tiny type. All right. That's not it. Here is the glory train. What you're about to see has never been shown on any video or anywhere in the history of the Aeonian times. And you're getting it here today. Here it comes. I hope the lighting straightens out before I show this. It has it. God, I'm, I'm, I, I got to move this around. I don't know what's happening with the lighting. I'm going to walk around until, I get, until I'm satisfied with this lighting because you need to see this. This is satanic. Satan's trying to block this revelation. I'm walking to the back of the house now, behind the cottage. This is ridiculous. I'm going to go back here by the trash can. I'm going to get in the shadows. Okay, I'm back, behind, I'm back next to the trash can, next to the ladder. This is where I do my best work. And still, and still. There. God, Christ, man, woman, tresses. See that? In this chart, in this chart, God is in light face type and small font. Christ is in a little larger font, still smaller face type. Man is darker yet, woman darker yet, and tresses, that is her hair, is the latest, greatest, darkest, largest fonted thing in this chart. What the hell am I saying with this? How could this possibly be? It's this, that this is, a, this is a train, a road of glory, not greatness. It's one thing comes out of another thing to glorify it. Christ glorifies the invisible God, and we only see God through Christ. Christ glorifies the invisible God. So you see this, the way, if you look at this train, if you look at this, it's kind of like it comes out, 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 and it gets darker and bigger because that is what is manifested. We're, see we're seeing things manifested with this chart. We're seeing things effulgently being projected. It's not that God isn't great in this chart. Is that, look, at this, look at this new chart now as that which is most invisible. That which is most invisible is God. The next most invisible thing is Christ. Haven't seen him around here lately. The next most invisible thing is man, but at least the people are walking around the planet and those who are believers should be reflecting the glory of, of Christ. And then a man gets married to his better half, otherwise known as woman, and she becomes his glory. That is, she ideally gives the world a better opinion of the man, uh, the Proverbs 31 woman, right? The man just sits in the gate and she does all this wonderful stuff and everybody thinks a man's a genius because his wife is thrifty, is smart, is clever, can multitask, and she's a freaking genius. So then the woman says, wow, what can the woman be? Her tresses and her glory, that, that, you see the chart now. The woman is, her glory is her tresses. What this tells me, think of the implications here. The implications are that if this is a glory train that starts with God, you saw it right there, it's in scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the glory train starts with God and ends with a woman's hair. It's like, what? 
the glory train starts with God and ends with a woman's hair. Do you, you know what this means? If you don't, I will tell you. This means that a woman's hair is the first contact that the world has with the glory of God on the earth. On the earth, the first cause, I'll say it again because it's so incredible. And even the angels know this. Paul says this is for the sake of the messengers. That a woman, her covering can be her head. She doesn't have to put a little cap on. Her hair was given to her in Eden for a covering. Instead of clothing, it says in Genesis. Instead of clothing, she was given hair. This is why... Let me slow down. A woman's hair is the first contact that the world at large has to the beauty, the brilliance, the glory of God. It has to start somewhere. It doesn't start with grass, doesn't start with wood, doesn't start with seashells or snails. It doesn't even start with the sun or the moon. It starts with a woman's hair. It's so beautiful. And women instinctively know this. This is why they take so such good care of it and why men roll their eyes at women. Don't do that anymore. Men, are you crazy? Let her take care of her hair. Give her whatever money it costs. There's no expense too great because this is the contact. The first contact that the world has. Uh, I showed you videos before of women letting down their hair. How did I find these? I went to YouTube and I typed in women letting down their hair. I'm telling you, we haven't seen God personally, but this is pretty damn close. Uh, and women instinctively know it because they take care of their hair. You go to Walmart and or any store and some stores are completely 100 percent dedicated to women's hair oh but at any store like walmart you see rows and rows of women's hair care products they're everywhere because the, everybody knows it they don't know why it is they just know that it is i'm telling you why it is it's so rare that you're actually finding out why this stuff is Anybody can tell you that it is. Oh, we just feel we just feel good when we see a woman's long hair. It's so beautiful. And Paul says nature itself is telling you that a man with long hair is weird. It's not glory. It's stu it is not. It's just not good. But a woman with long hair. Ah, oh, that's a different story. Paul's appealing to nature to tell you this. Appealing to nature. Nature itself tells you that a woman's hair is her glory. So, ladies, let it hang down but I see women all the time it's almost like they're beating their hair they they, they put these things on look, look at this thing I, I bought this women like to put these things on their hair I've seen women just torture their hair they grab it they pull it I have a friend with long beautiful hair what does she do she grabs it does this magic trick and stuffs it into a ball back there and then and then and then tortures it with a, a, a a rubber band, I get upset about this, I'm sorry, I'm kind of losing it here, tortures it with a rubber band on, until she looks something like this. I mean, how does it look? How do you like me like this? How do you like me when I put this on my hair? How does that look? I've seen some women, they like, they pull their hair back so far, it looks like, I don't know how their foreheads aren't bleeding. They're like, eh, get this shit out of here. They're yanking it back and they're just like, well, I don't have hair, I don't have hair. Yes, you do. And I will be happy to go through life with my hair like this, if that's what it'll take. If you want me to do this, I'll do this for you to show you, but this is not glorious. All right, this, is, this, is a, this is my shame. But you, you, you have this amazing gift. Let it down. Let the world be happy. Let the world see God. If you can't evangelize, if you can't hand out copies of my book, if you can't give them beyond politics, if you can't give them divine principles, if you can't give them first idiot, then at least let your hair down. At least let your hair down because that is your version, and it's true, and it's real, of evangelism. 